Uh, let's see, I have a really nice speech all prepared, but we'll throw that away. I don't like that stuff. I like talking to students. It's fun. I've been a professor for years, and it's just a hoot to excite people. I'd like to start off everything with Abby and her belief that we ought to think big, act big, and inspire others. So I want to make sure you guys remember to think big, because what I'm going to talk today is your future going to happen in the next 40 years. And I'm old enough that maybe I might not make the next 40. So, what I want you to remember, what we're talking about is your future. And there's no restriction there whatsoever. Now, I'm going to have a lot of charts. You don't have to read them all. There'll be no test. Okay? No test at all. We're going to go fast through this, but it's a very simple idea. The idea is that we have a routine read daily, massive, read 20 metric tons, safe, soft, lift, and it goes from the surface of the ocean to 100,000 kilometers that way. Now compare that to rockets. No, let's not compare that. We know rockets. Rockets are a lot of fun, and they're really exciting when you watch them take off. Uh, I always say that we're going to have routine rockets when one takes off and nobody applauds. If you go to a rocket launch when it's successful, everybody applauds. I mean, when an airplane takes off, do we applaud? I mean, when we're in the 777 go back to Seattle on Friday, I'll bet you nobody applauds when we take off. So what we want is routine access to space, not unusual success every time. So that's what we're shooting for, and this is a simple concept. Now, there are a few problems, we'll talk about that, but remember to think big. Now first, before we get going on space elevators, I want to just bring up a vision or two that's out there today. This is your future, so look at these. Whoops, i got to find this little thing here. Okay, SpaceX. Now this is a little company in California, and he has like $12 billion of backlog, people wanting to fly on his rockets. His corporate goal is 100,000 people on Mars in 40 years. This is a corporate goal. This is not somebody's wish. We were at the factory, and it was turned out that everybody at the factory has the same belief that we're going to Mars this is two-way, this is routine. You go there, you do stuff, you come back. It's a vision. 100,000 people in 40 years. Now, just to make sure that it wasn't just him, Elon Musk announced this in Guadalajara in September 27th of last year. And he said, oh boy, I'm going to have a rocket that's two times bigger than Saturn to do this. It's going to take off, it's going to land, it's going to be reusable, all kinds of stuff. Well, this guy named Jeff Bezos, who's a billionaire also, and he came up with, hey, no, 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 I'm going to have a bigger rocket. So the two of them are battling who's going to have the biggest rocket. There's Bezos, which is twice as big as Saturn, and uh, Elon Musk, which is two and a half times bigger than Saturn. These are concepts the guys are building today. This is your future. It's their vision right now, but it's your future. So Bezos wants to put a million people in space. Holy schnookers. Think about that. A million people in space and colonies around here and there. That's his vision. That's a huge vision, and that's your future. We're going to have off-planet. This is the way SpaceX wants to do it. Big vehicles. Now, let me make sure we're specific. SpaceX wants to put 150 people in one capsule and fly for nine months to get to Mars. Wait a minute, how many people want to be in a small capsule with 150 people for nine months? <laughs> it's going to be a big chance. Yeah, I'll go with you. I have, I have volunteered to wash the dishes, okay? I'll wash dishes, whatever it takes to get there. I want to go. Anyway, so he's got a big idea, and his idea is to have a ship like this, 150 people for nine months. Just keep thinking about that. Okay, but wait a minute. We have a big vision closer to home here. 
I know how hard it is to build spacecraft that you guys are doing a marvelous job. And I've got a copy of it right here. They gave me a little Hope, Hope satellite here. I think this is fantastic. It's hard to do what you guys have signed up for. It is a great challenge. And by taking on the challenge, you're moving ahead. You will be a player in the space community. There are only like six countries that have gone to Mars. And over 50% have failed. So you guys are right out there. You're with them. That's a fantastic vision. I love that one. Here's my vision. Space elevator. How does it work? The Earth turns. That's always a good concept to start with. Then what you do is you have a very long tether and you have a big rock at the end. And it's just like when you were a little child and you took a rock and put it around a spring and it went like this. Okay, the rock is way out there at the end of the circle and the string is taut. That's all it is. Just rotational motion keeps the pull out this and trivial force and so the string is taut. Then what you do is you put a one meter ribbon between the ground and the 100,000 kilometer up. Then you put two wheels on each side of it. They press against each other. It's friction. Turn wheels with electricity go up. Now it's a real simple concept. Been around for a long time in science fiction. But we believe we can get there. And the material obviously is the secret. And we've grown it to one meter in the laboratory. We haven't grown it to 100,000 kilometers yet, but we have very qualified researchers in two universities, Southampton in England and University of Cincinnati in, in Ohio. They both say the material will be there long enough and strong enough by 2025, 2028, something like that. So we can meet our schedule with like 2040 operations. It's a very simple concept. You have product on the surface of the Earth, you drive it out there with a ship to the uh, Galactic Harbor, you load it on, you go up the tether, you release it, and it goes off where it's supposed to go because it's rotating, okay? It has velocity. As you go up, the velocity gets greater. At one point, you release it, and it stays right next to it because it's at the geosynchronous altitude, so it's going at the same speed as the rotation of the Earth. Go a little further, you release it goes to the moon free of charge. Go up further, you release it, it goes to Mars, no chemistry required. So you can go all the way to Mars just by rotational energy. So that's my vision, the galactic harbor. But I also have a vision that we need to have an industry in space. We need to have a 7-Eleven or a gas station or a, a Conoco station, whatever it is, we need a gas station at the location called L1, which is equal gravity between the moon and the Earth, okay? Moon small, Earth big, so the points out toward the... It rotates with the moon. It's a phenomenal location to sit at. You bring a big asteroid, you mine the asteroid, you take the products of the mining, you put it on your spaceship, go wander off wherever you want in the solar system, and that's your little workstation there, rotating colony. So there are visions out there that are real. My point is, they're visions to me, that's the future for you guys. It's gonna be remarkable. We don't know what's gonna happen. Here's my agenda, plus or minus. Don't worry about if we finish the charts, that's irrelevant. We're just gonna go over a bunch of them. That's what it looks like, a space elevator. You've got a ground station, an earth port. You've got uh, tether climbers going up. You've got the apex anchor at the top, which holds the tension and keeps it solid there. And it's a very simple setup. So I'm the president of a little thing called the International Space Elevator Consortium. What we do is get together and talk about this, do research. We've come up with a, a few studies. We've looked at that real hard our answer is space elevators seem feasible. I won't stand up here and say the material will be re ready ever, but it will probably be ready. When the material is ready, the rest of it is a piece of cake. We can do that. So we've done all these types of studies. The International Academy of Astronautics has done some studies. Those are four-year studies with like 40 or 50 people working on it. 
and we've come up with some that is one space elevator and one is space mineral resources. And the answer is the future is phenomenal. What we're going to do in the future going to space is going to be remarkable. It's going to change the way we live on Earth. It will impact where we're going. So what have we done? Well, our community in space elevators have three viable architectures. What I mean by architecture is put it all together and it works. And we have three sets of different ideas that should work, and that's encouraging. So now is the time to look at research. Where do we go from here? But first we'll look at space elevators. Uh, why are we doing it? The answer is, it's a neat idea. Isn't that a good enough reason? I mean, why not? Let's go build one. What the heck? As somebody who's built spacecraft, you want to have a reason, and I think the good reason is why? Well, of course, we can do it. So let's go do it. It will make humanity stronger by giving us a really great vision and some place to go. What are we going to do with the space elevator? We're going to fulfill the missions that we need to fulfill out in space. It used to be science fiction. But in a few years, we're going to have people going to Mars, we're going to have people on the moon, uh, space elevators, so we can do all these things. Interplanetary exploration. Earlier, you saw a picture of Mae Jameson, an astronaut who's been to the space station. She's a pretty sharp lady. She's in charge of what I call the 100 year spaceship. Her mission in her little organization is to create a spaceship that can go to the next star in a hundred years. So in a hundred years, we have the technologies to go to the star. So her vision is a hundred years long. I guarantee you, she's not going to make it to there. <laughs> but the key is, you guys will make it. The vision is there. We need to take off. Well, it all started in science fiction, of course. Of course. All the good ideas start there. What we have is reality now a system overview for a space elevator that looks something like that. We have terms for it now. We're making great progress. We've got terminology for all those locations. Now, let's put it in perspective. How big is 100,000 kilometers? Oh, man, that's a hard one. I was talking to a group of six-year-olds, uh, six first graders, and they didn't quite understand that. They knew how far it was to Disneyland, but 100,000 kilometers a little too long for them. But if you take the radius of the Earth, about 6,000 kilometers, that's like 20 times the radius of the Earth straight out. It even goes outside of the shock wave from the sun. The solar wind coming in, you've got a shock wave. This would rotate through that each 24 hours. So it's a big structure that we're trying to build. Look, something like that, when we build it, what we do is we take a big spacecraft to geosynchronous, we let a little string down, we let a little string up, keep the mass at the center location, then you let a little more string down, a little more up, and you grab it at the bottom. And then you build it up until it's the size and shape you want it. But it looks like that. It's a, okay, hello. There we go. There's some pictures of nice uh, tethered climbers. The one on the left is the deployment one with all the ribbon. The one on the right is the build-up of the tether so you can build it up from just a single string to much wider. And then there's your baseline tethered climber there. So we've been thinking about how we do this and we've gotten along pretty good. Our ribbon would be 100,000 kilometers long and a meter wide. What we need is a whole bunch of strands in it so if a small piece of debris blew through it wouldn't even, uh, damage the tether, and we would have to move it for any big things like the space station. That's what the terminus at the bottom looks like, floating platform, not too difficult, we can do that. Uh, tether climbers, all kinds of answers, solar cells, the power, and the geosynchronous is an area which, where we can really make some money. It's a business opportunity there. Everybody wants to go to geosynchronous, do communications birds, weather birds, TV sets, all kinds of stuff. So that will be a lucrative area to take things to. 
Modern day architectures. Okay, Brad Edwards in 2000 to 2003 worked for NASA in an innovative study and came up with the answer. He started with the ideas of Jules Verne and Arthur C. Clarke and guys like that, but he was really excited about being able to do it. So in 2002, he came up with an answer that, hey, we can do this. We can do it today. Oh, except for the material. We've got to get the material. But there's about a billion dollars going into carbon nanotube research today. So we're hoping that those types of research will come out and make the material real. Uh, so he came up with this concept. His looks like that. He wants to put a gigawatt laser down on the bottom and radiate upward and take the energy from the laser and create your electricity that way. I'm not really sure I like a gigabit of laser looking at my satellites that I built and fly in space, so I'm not sure about that. But it's a viable approach. It could be the way we end up. Uh, there's a closer look at his uh, tether climber. The International Academy of Astronautics, 10 years after uh, Dr. Edwards, we sat down and we said, we can do better. We've got 10 years of experience. Let's study it. Let's look at it. So I, our answer came up, yep, we can do better. And we came up with the answer that it should be doable. And we're basing it on solar power. Uh, instead of having lasers, we bring our solar cells with us and we use solar power to generate it. So the assessment of 45 advanced in age, gentlemen and ladies that had experience, we said it should work. And it was very nice that the IAA, International Academy of Astronautics, agreed with that and published the report. So this is what we invented to help understand the atmosphere is a real bummer. You know, you got winds, uh, lightning, uh, storms, rain, everything. So what we do in the first 40 kilometers put it in a box, raise the box, and then at the 40 kilometers, take the satellite out. So the tether climber climbs out with its solar cells and it goes from there. That's the big difference between our study and Dr. Edwards. Now recently, to the surprise of many, including me, is the Obayashi Corporation. So it's a corporation in Japan who builds tall buildings in Tokyo, construction company. They decided to do on their own a study. So they studied space elevators, and this corporate entity came out and said, we can do it. So they published a paper that said, we can build a space elevator, and it should be operational about 2060. Now, the difference between theirs and ours was they're going to start with people. So their first space elevator is going to have a 100 metric ton carrier and like 10 people in it to go all the way up. So their approach is a little more aggressive than ours, but it's a very viable one, as you'd expect from a real construction company that actually builds things. Uh, they came up with their idea of how they're gonna do it, very similar to ours, except they're gonna take people. So now, remember, we started out with vision at the beginning. These guys have a vision that they can play and access to space inexpensively by building this system. So their vision was to do a human system floating on the surface and then going straight up 100,000 kilometers. So the Obayashi Corporation, Dr. Edwards, and the IAA, three separate independent studies that came up with the answer, we should be able to do that. Okay, what are the current status? Well, this is pretty chart, you can't read that. The answer is, if everything goes According to plan, we should up the operational in 2040 for a space elevator with robotics. The Obayashi Corporation said right around 2050, 2055, they can do people. So we can take people to orbit without putting them on top of a rocket. Okay, so what's left to do? What we need to do is do research in a whole bunch of topics to better understand what we're doing. And then when the material research develops and comes up with we can make 100,000 kilometer tethers, then we'll be ready to execute the program. So what we're doing is looking at grants, internal research, uh, collaborative research with other locations, 
we're looking at developing some topics. Our current study today that we're working on is the dynamics of this tether. It's a 100,000 kilometer piano wire. What frequency do you think that is? What wavelength? Just go like that ping. It's going to have a natural wave in it. So we have to understand all that. So our objective is to start to understand all this research. And we're trying to pull together a research foundation that will go ahead and do that. Look at the different technologies. It's something like that. We've got a bunch of directors that have some background. We've got some good objectives in the research, standard stuff on research. We've got some neat ideas. The number one topic to research, of course, is the material, carbon nanotubes. Will it be ready for us by, pick a number, 2025? And the answer right now is still out to be determined, but we have two great professors that think it will be. So 2025 to 2030, we should have material, we should be able to go forward. The climber design, high stage one, there's a whole bunch of areas that we're looking at. As I said, we've initiated studies on the dynamics. We have a few other areas we'd like to look at. We're working on those also, but not at a high pace. Uh, we don't need to see that, but it's a bunch of money. There's our schedule. And so summary and questions. OK, one thing I want to do is remind everybody that visions are important. We have to know what we want to do. We might not know how to get there. OK, most of us don't much of our life. We don't know how to get there, but we certainly know we want to know where we're going. Well, this is a quote I love. October 9, 1903, the uh, New York Times said, the flying machine will be ready in about a million years. Wait a minute. 1903, a credible newspaper said a million years, and then we'll have flight. Well, that was the same day the Orville Wright said, we started assembly today. So it's like that quote we heard earlier, which is, if you're a naysayer, don't stand in the way of the people that are actually doing the work, because the people out there doing the work don't want to listen to you. So we really have got to support the visionaries, the ones that are looking for the future. They're the ones that will help direct us. Well, the answer is, you all are the future, so why don't you help create it? Take your vision, your ideas, and go forth and do good and have fun, because it really is a hoot. I've done satellites for 45 years. The answer is it's hard. <laughs> it's all kinds of weekends and nights and all that kind of stuff, but I'll tell you, it's a real hoot. Being an engineer and seeing your satellite fly just really is very rewarding. So I'm really hoping that you guys have great success with your hope project, because what a neat idea to go to Mars. I think that's marvelous. What a great challenge. And there's definitely a vision there. I think that's neat. Okay, uh, I'm open for questions.